The United States had just came out of a depression, 1929, 1930, 31, all those years. And it's interesting because after they left the depression, they uh, came right into World War II. They went right into World War II. So Ike's amateur career was a little bit after the depression, but then his pro career started in the 40s. But Ike was part of that scene too, that really rough, you know, Philadelphia, New Jersey scene. I and mean, that was that was rough back then. I mean, he, he fought, those gym wars alone will put enough mileage on a fighter's odometer to where he's a has-been before he's even 25 years old. You know, you gotta be careful and pace yourself in those gyms. Uh, Ike himself, I thought, was, was, was a good technician. He learned how to use his height, motion. He learned how to time guys coming in. And those were some of the facets that you learn in boxing techniques and things that I kind of admire. Uh, rangy, very rangy because he had long arms and a long body, very tall for a lightweight. I mean, you look at the picture back there, he's taller than Jake LaMotta, who was a middleweight, much larger. Uh, but Ike's taller. So he liked to keep his jab low to try and bait you to throw the right so he can whip his jab up and nail you and then throw the right cross in. So I can knock you out with lots of punches, you know, left hook, right cross, whatever. He saw it as an art and, uh, you know, he honed his craft to be the best that he could be. And in those times, your parents uh, instilled and inculcated that in their children. Whatever you chose to be, be the best of whatever you could be. Yes, sir, that's it. Pabst Blue Ribbon. <laughs> The warning buzzer for round two, Ike Williams, lightweight champ of the world, and Vic Cardell of Hartford, Connecticut. And the mob was always a presence here and there, but it really got a toehold in, I think, in the 30s during the Great Depression, you know, when America was really down, and they had had their commission where they all agreed to come together and form one big unit, and they were killing it in the 30s. The mafia czar of boxing was a fellow by the name of Frankie Carbo. Uh, his nickname was Mr. Gray. He's actually generally believed to be the guy, the trigger man, who murdered Bugsy Siegel, famous mobster Bugsy. Uh, but he was the czar of boxing, and uh, his, his cohort, his little lieutenant, was Blinky Palermo. That's the guy that did all the stuff like in front of the cameras. That was the guy who, who ran things out here while Carbo was behind the scenes, a menacing, dark presence. But he, he was a dangerous fellow, and Blinky was his lieutenant, and he was the one who made all the deals and the bargains at the behest of Carbo. I was aware because I met um, Georgie Benton back from Philadelphia. And he was quite adamant about talking about a lot of things that were going on. And he said there was a couple of uh, people that he was acquainted with that if he didn't play ball with them, he couldn't play ball. In other words, he couldn't get any work. Well, from what I know and talking with Ike at times was the the fact that the mob was influenced in boxing. I mean, Ike came up with a genius idea about, you know, being his own manager. Obviously, they're not going to try and kill Ike Williams. I mean, that's like killing the goose that's laying the golden eggs, but you could teach the goose a lesson. So they uh, blacklisted him. Ike couldn't get any fights. And what he had to do was, in order to stay active and, you know, work at his craft, he fought uh, guys way out of his weight class. Sometimes he fought as high as middleweight when he was nothing but a lightweight. It, it put a lot of pressure on him to have to go through them, those tough and challenging times and still deal with all the competition coming up. Back then, you just had to be really careful. You know, if you, if you came out and told on the mob, you could wind up in a dumpster somewhere. That's what happens when you cross the mob back then. And uh, Ike eventually, okay, <laughs> Connie can come back. <laughs> he can be my, my manager, my trainer, whatever. And that's what happened, you know. But you had to kowtow. Jake LaMotta had to throw a fight to get a title shot, you know? I mean, Johnny Saxton, he was the world champ, totally mobbed up. So many guys were so mobbed up back then. Business is business. The top or 1% of any group usually mingles together. So we have to be wise in what we say, when we say it, and who we say it to. January 1950, the Windy City. Johnny Bratton of Chicago is getting ready to meet the world lightweight champion in an overweight bout. Bratton is a Chicago boy. Capacity crowd is on hand to root for this local favorite. Williams and Dark Trunks comes in at 143 pounds, heavier than at any of his previous fights. He has plans for moving up one division. I don't think Ike ever took a dive. I know he fought with the cuffs on, let guys go the distance. 
He had told me that Enrique Bolanos, who he fought three times, I beat him easily the first time they fought. The second time, suddenly, this is 15 round struggle, you know? And Ike had told me he had the cuffs on for that fight. They, they you know, for betting purposes and stuff like that. Mob didn't want Ike to throw the fight, because who was better than Ike? Who was gonna take over? If Ike threw a fight and Mob lost their great champion, then what, you know? Then what? They, they weren't gonna let Ike be dethroned. But fight with the cuffs on to get some betting coups and stuff? Yeah, okay, you know? If, if the bet is that Ike's gonna knock out Bolanos within four or five rounds, which he probably could have, because he did at one point, if that's where all the betting money goes and Ike lets him go the distance, Mob's gonna clean up. Have you ever threatened any manager or boxer or promoter at any time within the last 10 years for not carrying out any wishes in the boxing industry? I respect, Your wishes. I respectfully decline to answer a question on the ground that I cannot be compelled to be a witness against myself. You're directed to answer. I respectfully decline to answer a okay. question on the ground that I cannot be compelled to be a witness against myself. They screwed him out of money. I mean, there were certain fights he had he didn't see a penny for, he told me. They robbed me blind, you know, and they did. They took his money. He fought, they stole. You know, it's the same with every boxer, you know? They're not like football players, because those guys all get their college degrees before they play in the pros, and then when their careers are over, they open restaurants, this, whatever, you know, they get to use their degrees. Boxers, I can count on the fingers of maybe two hands how many boxers had college degrees, so what do you do when your career is over? Most of them trying to diffuse their lives from the attraction from the attention, from the news. I guess you're being addicted to something. It, it takes a, a little gathering of, of who you are to who you are becoming. And it takes this quite a transition there, psychologically and personally. Money fizzles out pretty quick. You know, there's usually not much of a retirement plan. Um, so they end up training usually. Some of them nowadays try broadcasting. Um, but in Ike's day, usually they got into training. When they see you, they recognize it, but your name comes up less in the paper. Uh, you have the less type of notoriety. Sometimes people will be standing next to you, they don't know who you are, but before everybody knew who you were. So you have to sort of diffuse yourself from all of that and become a normal person. That's probably one of the toughest things about it. You know, for Ike to be able to stand out at that time is just phenomenal, you know, that during the golden age. And he was one of the greatest fighters of that age, easily. When you look at Ike and his legacy, the unique thing about what Ike did, he fought everybody within the top 10, and uh, he beat most of them. You know, no easy pickings. I mean, every single one of those fights today is a multi-million dollar pay-per-view war that they take six months to, you know, to hype. So you had to be very good and be at the top of your game to be able to make those kind of accomplishments. And that's what makes Ike who Ike is. It's a champion's champion.